morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? So today what we're going to do is we are going to learn about the shortest path algorithm, and then we are going to learn about breadth first search. So we're going to continue to build on our understanding of graphs. So what is the idea? Well, here's where all the code is. So what is the general idea behind shortest path? So here we have a map of campus. And we're trying to find the shortest path from Fitzpatrick Hall to the Hesper Library. So we have all of these different potential paths. And here I have one in red. And that is a potential path from Fitzpatrick Hall to the library. But it's, while it's technically correct, it's not necessarily a good path. And here we have a much better path. And if you're going to the library straight from Fitz, you will probably take this one. So the question is, how do we actually figure that out? So it's important when we discuss what the idea of a shortest path is, that we actually have to start defining what these edges mean, other than the fact that they connect to vertices. So up to this point, we've assumed that all of the edges have the same weight. And you've seen me put them in the system when I've been uh, defining them, they all have an edge of one. However, that's not always the case. When we're going and we're trying to determine how to get to a certain location, when we're putting things into Google Maps, Google Maps takes into a lot of a, a significant number of factors into account, the, the normal amount of traffic at different times, the length, the speed limit. There are all kinds of different factors that go into when you get on a certain road at a certain time and you're trying to get to another destination, their estimate of how long that will take. So therefore, we kind of want to do the same thing. We're going to start adding weights to indicate how far or a certain amount of cost, as that's the word we're going to be using, the cost to go along a certain path. So here in the depth first search, what we did is we just figured out that there was a path from 4 to 18, and we have an adjacency list representation. And in depth first search, we realized that it is dependent upon how the user puts in the actual edges. But here we now need to consider the weights. So it's no longer just enough to know all this stuff. We actually have to evaluate the cost. So here to go from four to 20 to 10 to 18, which was the depth first search solution that I presented in lecture, it has a cost of nine. Here we have 20, 30, 18, and this has a cost of seven. And here we have four, five, 10, and 18, and that has a cost of eight. And so what we can see is that we have three different valid paths, but if we're trying to find the shortest path, we eventually want to find 30, 4, 20, 30, and 18. So the question is, how would we go about doing this? And how can we apply what we've learned so far this semester about data structures to improve the efficiency of the algorithm? So here's a crucial aspect. So we see our graph again, and we notice here on the right that if could ever cooperate, that the path from 10 to 18 is two. And we're comparing two different paths. And so in these two paths, we see that they both have to get through 10, right? Which means the shortest, let's, let's assume for a moment that the shortest path goes through 10, even though we demonstrated that it's not. In the event, if we're comparing these two paths, we know that since going through them both the same time is always going to be the same, it's always going to be two, that this means that we can compare these two paths, and that allows us to be able to determine the actual shortest path algorithm. This is driving me insane. So when we say this, that we have the path, what should actually happen is 10 to 18, we'll go off of both of those, 4 to 5 to 10, 4, 20, and 10 will be the same cost. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually use a stack, and we're going to use a hash table, and then we're going to use several of the similar principles that we did in the last lecture to be able to determine whether or not what the, short, what the shortest path actually is. So what we're going to do is we're going to mark 
each as visited, but then we are also going to have a distance. So what our goal is, is to determine the shortest distance between the origin and that specific node. And when we do that, that allows us to be able to figure out the actual solution. So let's take a look and let's start here. And we're going to start at four. When we're at four, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to evaluate 20 and we're going to evaluate five. And so what we've done here is we've now said that 20's parent is four and five's parent is four and 20 is three and five is one. So this is the weight from four to that specific edge. So this one's relatively simple. And so what we want to do is we're going to say, well, I want to put elements onto a stack. And when I put them onto the stack, I will be able to evaluate the, the path from that specific ed, node. So when I evaluate five, I look at what goes out. So this particular vertex five has one edge and it goes to 10, right? So if I, let me go back one animation so we can work through this and you can see how we're gonna come up with the solution. So five has one edge that goes out to 10 and it has a weight of four. And so what's gonna happen is we initialize all of the weights to infinity. And if the weight here is greater than the current weight from the parent, plus the weight on the edge. So in this case, we have one plus four. Does everybody see that? So what's gonna happen is 10 is gonna have its parent become five, and then 10's weight is gonna go from infinity down to five. Does everybody see that? So that's what the next thing is gonna be. And so now we're gonna update And now we put 10 on the stack. So now 10 is going to evaluate, and we're gonna say 10 plus two, the weight of 10 plus two is going to become 18. We now have 18's parent is 10 and its current weight. So then we put 18 on the stack. 18 doesn't have anything going out, so we can mark all of these as visited. So now we're gonna go back to 20. So now we're going to look at 20 from the perspective of evaluating 10 and evaluating 30. So we have 40, 20, and 10. That's the current weight of 20 is 3. And 3 goes here. We now make it 6. So 10's weight is 6. So we don't need to update that because we have an equivalent path that gets there in the exact same weight. But if we look at 30, we're going to see 3 and 2 is 5, right? And so what's going to happen is 30's parent is going to become 20. And then this is going to be 3 and 2 is going to become 5. And that's going to be the new weight. Like so. So then we're going to put 30 onto the stack. And we're not putting 10 because 10 has already been visited. And so we look at the output here is four. And we see that the current weight here is 10. And we have five and four. So what we're gonna see here is five plus four is gonna be nine. Nine. The numbers are wrong. So what's going to happen is we're going to replace that with the weight. And then we now have, we're going to take advantage of that pointer. All right, so let me actually, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to, all right, let's go to this slide. And now I'm going to work through it again really quickly because this will make the numbers work and match. So we start out at four and we do 20 and five. So we do, uh, we'll put the values here, four, 25, 
10, 30, and 18. And as of right now, they're all infinity. Right? And so we'll say that four is initially zero because it starts at itself. And then 20 and five, we're going to say that 20's weight is going to be three. And five's weight is going to be one. And we have parents of four and four. And so now we're going to put those on the stack. So you have 20 and five over here. So now we're going to move to five. And we see that we have a weight of five to 10. And so 10 is currently infinity. One plus five is going to be six. So six is less than infinity. And then we're going to say 10's parent is five. Then we remove five from the stack. And we're going to place that edge that we evaluated. So now 10, it's only outgoing edges to 18. So 10 currently has a weight of six. We're going to say six plus two to 18. 18's current weight is infinity. So 18's new weight becomes six plus two, which is eight. And its previous parent, its parent is 10. Okay, so everybody see that so far? So now what we're gonna do is we are going to remove that and now we're gonna evaluate everything from 20. So 20 has outgoing to 30 and 10. So we look at the weight going to 10, 20's current weight is three, so three plus four is seven, right? Well, 10's current weight is six, so therefore we do not overwrite it. Then we look at 30, 30's current weight is infinity, so now we have three plus two is five, so now we re erase the infinity and replace the weight with five, and then we say the parent is 20. So now we remove 20 from the stack. And since we updated 30's weight, we're now gonna put 30 on that stack. And so now we evaluate the outgoing here. And we currently have a weight of five at 30. Five plus two is seven. So now let's evaluate the weight. 18's current weight is eight. And since it's seven now, we can say, oh, we, we can beat it. So now we're gonna say this is seven. And then its parent is 30. And now it's off. And then the last thing we do is we start at 18. We say the weight is seven. And then we say eight, let me sorry. Let me say 18 to 30. Let me look at 30, 30's parent is 20. 20's parent is four and four doesn't have a parent. So now we have, no, this is the correct answer. We have four, 20, 30, and 18 with a weight of seven. Does everybody see that? Okay. I'll fix those. Okay, so now let's take a look at the at some actual code. So I want to walk you through my design process on how I design this algorithm. So this implements what we have here. So first, like before, lines 405 through 410, what I'm doing is I'm checking to make sure that the user's input is valid. So first I say that the, the Destin is greater than, we say if Destin is greater than or equal to the length or here, vertices.length is equal to zero. That means we are checking to make sure we're not performing a shortest path algorithm on an empty graph. Then the next part, now I initialize that stack that I was using. I now initialize the dynamic array of parents, and I initialize that to vertices.length, although because of the fact that um, we are allocating the exact amount of information we know. We could, use, we could do uh, a, a, a static array of unsigned integers. We could use malloc 
and allocate it to vertices.link. That would be acceptable as well. So that could be a slightly more efficient way of allocating the memory. But I do want to point out that this entire graph that we've built is entirely built out of previous data structures we've done so far this semester. So everything that we've done here is just code, pointers, and class methods. So everything that we learned all the way back in week one, now we're applying it all here. And then we're gonna have that stack for the final path. And so that's just gonna be like what we did with depth first search on, um, on Wednesday, when we went through and used the Sentinel to print out the final path. I'm just quicking, quickly checking to make sure that we don't have any questions in the chat. So here, sorry. So here I have, I initialize Boolean to be false, so I haven't found it. So this allows us to be able to tell the user later on if there is no path between these two. And then we have, I'm gonna push zero onto the origin. So zero, to remind you, is the index of the vertex in the, in the, uh, in the uh, JSON seamless representation. Then I say that the distance of that is zero, and the parent of the origin is negative one. And that allows us to be able to indicate that uh, we can stop going backwards. Then just like I did with the depth first search, I said if the destination is equal, equal to zero, we're gonna indicate that we found it. Shortest path from zero to zero, perfect. No need to run our algorithm. Then I say, if it's not found, then what I have done is I've iterated through this unsigned integers, and I'm setting distance equal to this value. That is the largest possible signed 32-bit integer. So we're gonna use that to represent as close as we can to uh, infinity. And then we're setting all the parents equal to negative one. Okay, so now, let's, well, now we're gonna go into the uh, big portion. One of the crucial aspects of it, so those of you, so those of you who started working on the uh, Pacific and Atlantic water flow problem for Creativity Challenge 4, when you're, when you're reviewing my, out, my code for using the queue, right? That the algorithm kept going until the queue was empty. So you do a first in, first out, and once you ran out of things to evaluate, you knew one of two things. Either you had found the location you were looking for, or there were no more places to look. That's why today's lecture is called No More Worlds to Conquer. It's a breadth first search type thing. This is the same kind of thing. We're gonna put elements onto the stack when we want to evaluate them. So while the stack is not empty, that means we have more places to look there's a, another possibility that we could potentially find a shorter path. Once the stack is empty, one of two things has occurred. Either, one, we have found the shortest path and we have a solution, or we did not find the path itself. So this is one of the benefits of using stacks and queues in these kind of problems. Because, and, this is, and I forget who it was who asked me this question on Slack about why should we use queues, in these particular things, because you have first in, first out, and you can maintain what it is that you want to track, one of the benefits of using these data structures is that you have a logical way in which to guarantee to terminate the algorithm. That becomes really important when you're actually trying to run these. So that's why here we have while the stack is not empty. So then what I do, these two lines, now I have to do these separately because top, as we remember from, uh, or you may not, it's okay, it's that time of the semester, it happens. Um, when we're looking at the top of the stack, we have to get a copy, right? We don't wanna manipulate that because we're not changing the element at the uh, front of the, um, in this case, the stack, so it's a singly linked list. And then the stack, we remove it, so we use that pop front underneath when we aggregate on the class. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna iterate through each vertex. Specifically, I have the number of edges outgoing from the current index that we popped off. So in this case, the first step, we pop off the origin. So now we're looking at zero and we're looking at all the edges going out. This specific line, uh, line four, 449 and uh, 450, I am making a copy of the edge. And the reason I'm doing that is because if I didn't do that, everywhere I have temp edge, you see here at 53, 
I would otherwise have to call this over and over again. So this is just a simplicity for readability. At this line at 453, this is where we are comparing the current weight that we have in our distance dynamic array with the distance at the index plus the weight that's outgoing from that temporary edge. So this is that step where initially we're comparing and say, whoa, it's infinity. So therefore we're definitely replacing it. But then when we got to towards the end of the uh, shortest path algorithm, we saw that we were able to compare that the previous value was eight and we had distance was five plus the weight of the edge was two, five plus two is seven. Therefore, we were able to prove that this was a shorter path to that particular vertex. So this line here, does that work for us? Okay. Then once I've proven it, I actually just overwrite it. I say the distance to that particular vertex, temp edge destin, is equal to this distance index plus temp edge weight. So temp edge destin, we are currently where we are and the destination is the destination vertex. So now we have the shortest possible path to that destination. And then here I set the parent of that destination equal to the index because the index is the origin of the, of the edge. So here I say if temp destination is equal to the destination and it's not found, we're going to set it to true. Now remember that we're not going to terminate the algorithm if we find it, because as we saw in the uh, animation example, it, it, we have multiple paths that we can evaluate. But because we are able to say that we found it, we can now tell the user towards the end of the uh, run, oh, hey, we did find it or no, we didn't find it. And then I push the destination onto that specific edge. And now the reason why we know it's going to terminate is because at some point we're going to either not find it and evaluate every possible location, or we are going to find it, and at some point we will stop evaluating nodes. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Let me, let me check the chat real quick. Don't see anything in the chat. All right, so now let's go with what happens if we actually find the vertex. So if we find the vertex, what's going to happen is we're going to do the same thing we did last lecture. We're going to set up a sentinel, and I'm going to push the sentinel onto that final path stack. So now I'm putting the last thing, and it will go up first, so that way we'll have a reversed element. So while parents does not equal sentinel, now we do that while loop where we keep putting elements onto the stack like we did before. And then the valid Dijkstra path from zero to the destination is, and we print all the elements out, and the distance is the distance that we have saved in that dynamic array. All right, so if nobody has any questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to And so here I have the exact same graph in the code that I had on the slide. And what I've done is I found zero to five and we correctly determined that the shortest path was seven. But then in that code, what I'm doing is I'm running this algorithm over and over again on every possible node in the graph. We see five, four, three, two, one, and zero. And we know that one, the path from zero to one, has a weight of three because in the graph, it was from four to 20. And we remember we had that edge had a weight of three. And then finally I had my two cases where I'm trying to exceed the size of the uh, graph. And then the other time I am trying to uh, create another empty graph and tried to run it and it caught that as well. Okay, does anybody have any questions? All right, so the next thing I'd like to show you is this idea of breadth first search.
So we have the depth first search, which we've already studied. And in depth first search, I've used this analogy if, is, if we're trying to find our way out of the Morris Inn. Depth first search. I, wow. Sorry about that. Wow. Okay. Having, I'm having a morning. Uh, okay. So earlier this week, we we're talking about depth first search. And the thing about depth first search is it was local. We had to go through certain uh, hallways, but that's all we knew. And that's kind of like trying to go through like a corn maze. In a corn maze on the right, you only see what you can see. You can't see anything else. Whereas with breadth first search, what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate each possible path. And then we're going to put things onto a queue and then evaluate every possible path again. So I've seen an example of this briefly at the end of the queue lecture when we had that matrix and we used the breadth first search to look through everything. But now we're going to do this in a graph with an adjacency list representation. So what's going to happen is we are going to be at a specific vertex, the origin, and then we're going to put each element into the queue. And then we will move to that first element into the queue. Evaluate, put all those elements into the queue. But here's the difference. Instead of going to in a duck manner like we did before, we are now going to move to that second possible option and evaluate all those and then do the same thing with the third option. So here's breadth first search and the, ultimately what it's doing is it's kind of turning it into what we're going to study a little later in the semester uh, starting next Friday I believe and then we'll continue for a good chunk of the semester on these. A data structure known as a tree. The difference between a graph and a tree is that each vertex contains a set number of uh, what are known as child nodes. And these will go to specific locations. And a binary search tree allows us to be able to sort in a specific order. But now what breadth first search is gonna do is we're gonna evaluate all of the outgoing nodes from each vertex. And if it hasn't been visited, we will put it in a specific way. So the simplest way to do this, it would start with the origin at four. And then we're going to evaluate all the edges going out from four. And since 20 and five have not been visited, we would say it like this. And then in that adjacency list representation, 20 would be first. So we 20 would be at the front of the queue and five would be next. So we'd say, well, 20 has outgoing to 10 and 30 like so. And then, we, so we would put 10 and 30 onto the, onto the queue. Then we remove from the front of the queue and now we evaluate five. Well, the only outgoing edge in this particular graph is to 10 and 10 has already been visited. So we're not gonna add any, we're not gonna seek search any further. So now 10 is at the front of the queue. And so 10 has one outgoing for 18, and then we put 18 at the back of the queue. Now that we're done, we remove 10. Now we look at 30, 30 only has one outgoing element. So in that case it's 18, which has already been visited. And then we look at 18 and 18 does not have any outgoing edges. So this is a breadth first search. Whereas if we were doing a depth first search, it would be four, uh, it would go to 20, then we would go to 10, then we go to 18, then we would go to 30, then we would go to five, like so. Now in this case, it does produce the exact same tree, but you see how it searches differently. So here is how we would actually do this at a more code specific level. Now we're implementing data structures to solve this problem. So we start at four, and just like before, we place the parent at negative one, and four is visited verts. So now, what are we gonna put into the queue? So uh, who wants to tell me what's gonna go into the queue?
Any ideas on the chat? If we are evaluating all the outgoing edges from four, what would we be putting into this queue? Yes. Yeah, 20 and five, very good. That's exactly right. So we, now we've put 20 and five, and now that we've seen all of the outgoing, we're now gonna remove four from the queue, and now we're gonna move to the element at the front of the queue. So now that we're at 20, what elements are we gonna put into the queue? Yes, in fact. 10 and 30, right? And now their parents are both marked as 20. And so 20 is now removed from the queue. And then five, we have one outgoing node to 10. Since it's already been visited, we're not gonna do anything. So five is now removed. So 10 is there. And now we're gonna put 18 into the queue and mark its parent as 10. And now we're visited. And so we see that the full breadth first search is 4, 20, 10, and 18. All right, so coding the breadth first search. Okay, so we got several comments in the chat. All right, so 20, 20, and 5, 10, and 30. So yes, uh, Brandon and Fang Hong, both, all of your answers were absolutely right. All right, so going back over what it is that we've done. So let's put together, and one good thing about graphs, especially at the midpoint of the semester like this, is it also gives you an opportunity to kind of reflect and think back on all the data structures that we built to get here. So what have we implemented so far? So we've learned about a this pointer that points to a location in memory. We've learned about private members in a class. So in order to do this, we've learned about being able to store a dynamic array onto a data heap. And we are storing this dynamic array and allows us to store the specific values. So now we're using templates. Then in order to perform these operations, we're now using class aggregation. We have an edge. That edge is now built with vertex. And that vertex, we have several vertex and it is that dynamic array is the vertices. That allows us to build an adjacency list representation. So all of this, we're building pointers on top of pointers on top of pointers. The dynamic array for uh, the vertices, it, we can keep adding elements to the graph. So now we are doing memory allocation. We're doing memory allocation over and over again. But now we wanna be able to search these efficiently. So we did, first we did depth first search. Depth first search, we found that the best way to do that was a stack. So a stack, we built a stack, which we built off a singly linked list. Now we're gonna use a queue. A queue, we built off of a doubly linked list. So all of that involves class aggregation, templates, and pointer applications. And memory allocation, you know, the rule of three, whole nine yards. So getting this breadth first search application in means that we've also demonstrated all the knowledge that we've built up to this point. All right, so first I wanna show you the breadth first search. All right, so first we have, I've coded up the case where we're only gonna look from the origin. So we have an origin on bless you. We only have, only have the origin and it's, uh, the, the next step will be, let's do a breadth first search between two different nodes in the graph. So here, just like before, we have our case where I'm testing to make sure that we don't over, uh, go over the bounds of the graph. And then, now I've created my queue. This is my queue to keep track of the breadth first search. Here I've uh, revisited, we're gonna have a, a uh, visited array. And here I've done a static array. And now I'm used our knowledge of object-oriented programming. So instead of malloc, I just use new bool and set it to the number of vertices. But we know that what's going on underneath is the actual void pointer that's then being cast to the Boolean pointer. And then we are allocating uh, that length, time, size of bool. 
And then to make sure that I overwrite all those elements, because we're using new, new doesn't overwrite the underlying data in this data heap. So if I'm using malloc, malloc has this for loop underneath. But now what I'm doing is I'm just looping through all of these, vertic these uh, vertices and saying that none of them have been visited yet. And now I have an unsigned integer array where I'm setting them all equal to uh, all the parents. And we're eventually going to have all the parents be uh, set there. And then I have that final path stack, and that stack, again, final path, just like we did before, would we use the sentinel to find our solution. I set found equal to false, parents of the origin equal to negative one, and then destination zero. Once again, if we found it, it's true. So now, while we haven't found it and the queue is not empty. So the first step, I want to get the, I'm going to, uh, where do I, I have to have Q push somewhere. There it is. Okay, I apologize. I skipped over 533. So at 533, what I've done is I've pushed the origin node zero onto the queue. And so let me throw a theoretical out at you. Let's say I have one vertex and I'm trying to find, uh, let's say I have several vertices and I have this vertex, but I don't have any outgoing edges. I'm trying to find a path. What do you think will happen? How will this algorithm catch that we don't have a specific um, element in there? What do you think is going to happen? Let's do this a little thought experiment. Let's say I have eight vertices in the graph. And this particular edge, uh, let's say uh, vertex zero, for some reason, it's disjoint from the graph. We aren't able to find anything else there. How would we, what would happen in this particular algorithm? And in fact, I'll even draw it up for you, see if I can generate some more conversation. So we have four. Okay, so this is our graph. And this is the one at zero. So what will happen here if I try to start a breadth first search? Exactly right. So I would put zero into the queue, and then I would be looking for any outgoing edges. But it turns out I can't put them in there. So what's gonna happen is we will remove that from the queue, and then it will determine that we, there is not a valid path. And does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so let me go back to, okay, so here we are. So we're at front and pop. And now I'm gonna say visited vertex is equal to true. And now what I'm doing is I'm gonna iterate through each edge. As I'm entering through each edge, what I'm doing is I'm getting the destination vertex. So here I have unsigned int edge destin, vertices vertex, so that gives me the location. I will get that specific edge since I'm iterating through each edge. And then dot destin is the element in the struct that tells me where the destination of that edge is. Then I have a case that if the edge destination is equal to the destined, then I say found is equal to true. I set parents of edge destined equal to vertex, and then I break the while loop. Otherwise, if this specific edge is false, meaning that we haven't visited it yet, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to push that destination onto the back of the queue. And then I'm going to say that that parent's uh, uh, edge's parent is the current vertex that we're at. And that's what's going on here. And then I mark that destination edge as true. And that allows me to ensure that 
if we come at that edge from another pathway that we won't evaluate. And then here, we're going through the last kind of same thing. We have, if it's not found, no valid path to origin uh, from destination. Then I set the de sentinel equal to the destination. And I push that on there. And then but I do the same while loop as I've done before. And then I get that, I push that parent onto it. And then I set sentinel into equal to the parent. And I keep going through as I've done before until we get to the point that I've reached that negative one. And here, I say the final path, if it's not empty, I will pop all the elements off of the stack in order to get that information. All right, so does anybody have any questions about how that works? All right, we have a comment in the chat. The while loop will end because the queue will be empty after the first run. So Fang Kong is correct, very good. So I run make BFS. I have the exact same graph as before. And then we see that it finds all the breadth first search paths from the origin to uh, and all the way to the end where I say, well, here's the case where zero found itself. And then I say six is not a valid vertex location. And then I tried putting in negative one into an unsigned integer. So it prints out 4,294,967,225 is not a valid vertex location. Give us a while loop. All right, so next thing we're going to do, and this is how we're going to uh, go through the rest of class, is what do I need to do to change that algorithm to be able to perform a bet first search from any specific vertex to any other specific vertex? Let me make, make, make the chat available so I can see things come up there. So what did we do? Yes. Absolutely right. So what we want to do is, First, well, okay, so you're at, so you, I have three steps that I want to do, and you're at step three. So we've finished uh, step three. So what do we think, what's the first thing we need to do if I wanted to change this, uh, if I want to change this so that way I could search from any origin to any destination? What would be the first thing I, I need to do? Yes. Absolutely right. We're going to that. So step one of three is we are going to take in origin and destination as a parameter. So that last step that we have is we're going to have to push that or new origin onto the queue. But what's the middle thing? What do we have to do in order to set everything up properly to run the algorithm? I'll give you a hint. We did it on Wednesday for depth first search, and it was, as you probably saw it, you noticed it was probably really uh, relatively trivial, but made a huge difference. Yes. Right. So we, what we're going to do is we are going to replace everything that we had with zero with the new input origin. So then once we do that, then we get to step three, which is that then we take pick in the red and origin, and that's going to be the first element that we put onto the queue, and then the algorithm will do everything else for us as we've designed. So that's exactly what happens. So now what I want to show you in graph eight is now I have breadth for search, origin, and destiny. And so I've done the same thing. I've checked to make sure that origin is a valid input and that destin is a valid input. And I've checked to make sure that we don't, are not running it on an empty graph. Then I have the same thing. I have the queue. And then bulls visited. And just like before, I mark all the elements visited to be false. And then I do the same thing with parents. I have all the as unsigned in parents that allow me to find the, the vertices. I then have my stack. 
I say bool found is false, and then this is that step three, push origin, not push zero. So up to this point, we've verified that origin is in the graph. Now we've done the same thing with setting everything up, but now all we have to do is do origin, and then likewise here at line 654, that instead of setting parents of zero equal to negative one, we set parents of origin equal to negative one, and that allows us to be able to use that sentinel to print everything out. From there, pretty much everything is the same. We say if the destination is equal to the origin, we return true. Otherwise, if we haven't found it, now we're doing the exact same thing. So this gives me an opportunity to walk through the breadth first search algorithm one more time just to reinforce. We set the vertex equal to the element at the front of the queue. So before we were getting zero, but now we're getting the origin that was requested by the user. And then we pop it off. We then set that, vis that vertex equal uh, visited equal to true. And now we iterate through each edge. That destination edge is equal, so we have the array of vertices at that specific vertex. This is the one we read off the front of the queue. Then we get that specific edge correlating to iter, and then we get that destin from the uh, struct. From there, if the edge is equal to the destination, we say found is equal to true, and we set the parent equal to the vertex, and then we break the while loop. And we break the for loop, excuse me. And then I have, if it hasn't been visited, we push that destination edge onto the back of the queue. We then set its parent equal to the destination edge. And then we mark that destination edge as visited. So if it's not found, we just say it, we can find it. Otherwise, we do the same thing with our Sentinel. We go through, push back the destination onto the Sentinel. Then we go through it negative one. So that would be... 18, 30, 20, and four, like so, until we hit the parent which, to the origin. And this will still work because the origin will now have negative one, not the actual zero origin. And then finally, I'll print the breadth first search result, like so. So let me run make BFS2. And so now, what I have done is zero to five and zero to four, but now as notice I have the valid breadth first search path from one to four. And if we start at one, we see that there's an edge that's outgoing to four. I have two to four and there is no valid path from two to four. So our algorithm worked, we caught it. And then I've tested thoroughly to see if I can get several values. And I also did another test from five to five. So before I only did zero to zero, but now I'm checking to make sure that uh, origin and destination for any valid vertex will also be caught. And then like before, I've just tested to make sure that my invalid inputs are verified. All right, so does anybody have any questions about shortest path algorithm or breadth first search? All right, on that note, it is time to go. So uh, I will, main, I will uh, keep my eye on the Slack. And uh, you all have a good weekend. And I will see you all on Monday. And congratulations, we've made it halfway through the semester officially. Oh, that was the most excited you were all, all day. Halfway to freedom. <laughs>